on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians. <laughs> yes, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good morning and welcome to Sunday with Arlene Foster. Well, it was a day of tradition, ceremony and history, and I loved it. The coronation of King Charles III was filled with red, white and blue as millions of people celebrated the crowning of the king. Despite the rain from the thousands of people lining the route in the capital to the millions of people watching on television, the first coronation for 70 years left up to all expectations. Today, the spotlight shifts to the people's celebration, with street parties, lunches and community events planned throughout the four corners of the United Kingdom. We'll reflect on all the excitement from yesterday and look forward to what's planned for today. That's all after the news with Ray Addison. Good morning. It's one minute past 11. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. The Metropolitan Police is facing criticism for arresting 52 people on the day of the coronation. The force says they were taken into custody for an array of offences, including conspiracy to cause a public nuisance. Graeme Smith, the chief executive of anti-monarchy group Republic, was held for nearly 16 hours. He says there's no longer a right to peaceful protest in the UK. However, the Met says the arrests were made in a proportionate manner in line with relevant legislation. Coronation celebrations are continuing today as thousands of people across the country prepare to hold a coronation big lunch. The Prime Minister and his wife are hosting one in Downing Street with volunteers, Ukrainian refugees and the First Lady of the United States expected to attend. The Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh will join a big lunch in Cranley in Surrey and Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie will take part in one in Windsor. Buckingham Palace is calling the lunches a nationwide act of celebration and friendship. Then later this evening, 20,000 people will join the newly crowned King and Queen at Windsor Castle for the Coronation Concert. Take that, Katy Perry and Lionel Richie will all be performing with special appearances from Tom Cruise, Dame Joan Collins and Sir Tom Jones. As part of the concert, light displays will be lit over historic landmarks, including Blackpool's seafront, Gateshead's Millennium Bridge and the Eden Project in Cornwall. These people in Windsor told us they're looking forward to it. It's been very special. Um, it's not normally quite as jolly and full of bunting as this, but um, it's been great to see people from across the globe come to our town. Uh, we're from Thailand, yeah. It's, yeah. it's very nice uh, to be a part of this, <laughs> and uh, we uh, like to see everyone celebrating, of course, for the king, and uh, the, he has been waiting for so long. <laughs> There's expected, I think, 20,000 or 40,000. I have no idea, but it's going to be really busy. <laughs> Prince Harry has arrived back in California less than 24 hours after his father's coronation. The Duke of Sussex caught a British Airways flight just hours after the service to return home to celebrate his son's fourth birthday. Yesterday marked his first public appearance alongside his family since the release of his controversial memoir, Spare. Ailsa Anderson is the former communications secretary to Queen Elizabeth II. She told Camilla Tomine Harry did well to juggle his responsibilities didn't have a, a, a part to play because he's not the heir apparent. And of course it was Prince Archie's birthday yesterday, yes. his fourth birthday. 
having to, to combine his official duty as the king's youngest son with his duty as a father. And we know, as working women, you know, it's a balancing act, isn't it? Yes. So he managed to, you know, well done him for doing both yesterday. Well, thousands of Liverpool fans booed the national anthem before kick-off against Brentford yesterday. God Save the King was played at all Premier League grounds to celebrate the coronation, but some people in the stands at Anfield chanted and jeered during it. The club's manager, Jurgen Klopp, has defended those fans. Well, we have, thank God, since a while, and not everything is better nowadays than it was in the past, but we have the freedom of free speech, and that means of free opinion as well. And I thought how the people did it. It was clear that something like this will happen. I think everybody knew it. Um, and that's allowed, meanwhile. And it's allowed, and that's fine. At least eight people have been killed and seven wounded in the United States after a man opened fire at a mall near Dallas, Texas. The gunman, who authorities think acted alone, was killed by a police officer. The injured includes a five-year-old child, and three people are said to be in a critical condition. There have been nearly 200 mass shootings, with at least four victims in the U.S. so far this year. At 3.36, our officer was at Allen Premium Outlets on an unrelated call. He heard gunshots, located the gunshot, located the shooter, neutralized the shooter, neutralized the threat. We believe at this point that the shooter acted alone. This is an ongoing active investigation. That was uh, Allen Police Chief Brian Harvey. Now, reports of a suspicious object in Oma last night led to a police station and surrounding homes being evacuated. The police service of Northern Ireland cordoned off the Derry Road area and asked members of the public to avoid it. A car has reportedly been abandoned outside the station. It follows the shooting in February of Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell at a sports centre in the town. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Sunday with Arlene Foster. Thanks, Ray. Well, it was meticulously planned, the procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey, the moment of crowning and the appearance of the slimmed-down working royal family on the balcony. Before a congregation of world leaders, foreign royalties, celebrities, charity workers, friends and family, and even Prince Harry, although obscured by Princess Anne's huge hat. The coronation of King Charles III took place as planned. Let's take a look at the highlights with GB News royal correspondent Cameron Walker. History in the making. A newly crowned king and queen greeted their subjects who, despite the rain, erupted in cheers and applause. The stage was set inside Westminster Abbey for a ceremony dating back to 1066, full of traditions with a modern twist. A VIP guest list of world leaders and foreign crowned princes were for the first time joined by community heroes who make a difference to people's lives. An opportunity for them to mingle with TV royalty as well as the real deal. Prince Harry, no robes or special uniforms, proudly displayed his military medals. No longer a working royal, he flew alone to attend his father's coronation. A fleeting visit, no time for small talk with his brother. Instead, flying back to California to attend his son's birthday celebrations. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! Led by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the ceremony was full of tradition, religion and service was at its heart. Whether they be thrones or dominions... Rishi Sunak, a practising Hindu, gave a reading from the Bible as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Will you solemnly promise and swear... His Majesty was presented to the people and swore an oath to them. I solemnly promise so to do. The most holy part of the service, the king donned a simple white shirt. This was a moment between him and God. 
screen shielded him as the Archbishop of Canterbury anointed King Charles with holy oil. Perhaps the climax of the service, the moment the monarch receives the royal regalia, the spurs, the sword of state, the super tunica, the orb, the sovereign's ring, a glove worn by his grandfather for his coronation, the sovereign's scepter with cross, the rod of equity and mercy, and St. Edward's crown. Pledge my loyalty to you. The Prince of Wales, heir to the throne, pledged his allegiance to the king with a kiss on his father's cheek. King Charles's consort, who's been by his side for decades, was crowned and anointed as Britain's queen. Their majesties retired to St Edward's Chapel. King Charles and Queen Camilla wore robes of estate to leave the abbey. The coronation procession saw the largest number of military personnel since Winston Churchill's funeral march through central London. A small group of anti-monarchy protesters jeered in Trafalgar Square, but were mostly drowned out by royal fans. In the procession to Buckingham Palace, the Prince and Princess of Wales, along with their children, Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis, waved as onlookers from the Australian state coach. The royal family pages and ladies in attendance smiled and waved for the jubilant crowds. A scaled-back flypast roared over central London. Today, coronation celebrations continue across the country. The third Carolean era has well and truly begun. Cameron Walker, GB News. Well, that was a lovely catch up from Cameron Walker. And we'll talk live to Cameron and indeed to GB News reporter Will Hollis in a few moments. But first of all, let's talk to royal broadcaster and historian Rafe Heil Manku. Well, Rafe, you must be exhausted. Uh, it's been quite the weekend so far, hasn't it? It was lovely being outside the palace, but I think five days was long, <laughs> was long enough. I've been a dry, warm studio. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, what, I mean, Rafe, you have been a royal watcher and a historian for many years now. I mean, what were the standout moments for you yesterday? Well, I thought the whole thing was a triumph from, mm. from start to finish. I'm a staunch traditionalist, and I have to say, I did criticise that early on some of the decisions to get rid of traditions. It didn't matter in the end. Mm. The coronation service is so rich with ceremony that even if you slice off a few things, it doesn't detract at all from the power and mm. the majesty of that, of that occasion. Standout moments for me, well, as with the Queen's coronation in 53, the first arrival of the King and Queen into the Abbey to the strains of Hubert Parry's I Was Glad. Oh, I know. A beautiful, was beautiful setting of Psalm 122. <laughs> and the, the, the scholars of Westminster School, as they've done since the days of Elizabeth I, are the first to acclaim the new sovereign with the vivats. Mm -hmm. Vivat Rex Carolus, Vivat Camilla. I don't mind saying I had a couple of tears in my eye at that point. And then, of course, with the anointing with Zadok the mm, priest, mm. when the king is shielded from view, just adding to the solemnity, and one, one realises this is also a sacrament. It this is. isn't just a contract between the people and the sovereign. It's a covenant between God and the king. And we're the only country in Europe and the only monarchy to actually still have that religious element. And that was clear throughout the service. Yes, there were some modernizations, but I thought, you know, in a way, it's, it's a 21st century medieval coronation, yeah. if I can put it that way. Yeah. And I suppose also very powerful for me was the sight of the king in his gold super tunica mm. with all the symbols of sovereignty, the crown and the rod and scepter as in that chair. And we've never seen in high definition, close up that scene before. We've seen the Queen's coronation in 1953, but technology was so poor back then, it looked like a Hollywood epic because the cameras were so far back. I know. All you got was the big set. Here we were able to come right into the ceremony. It was a much more intimate experience than I was anticipating. Mm. And the King looked vulnerable at times, which I think is appropriate because the vulnerability of a person upon whose shoulder that great weight is about to be placed, I thought it was a re remarkable thing. I thought it was remarkable too, and I, I loved the part when uh, his son William came to pay homage to him as well. I thought that was amazing. Well, I'm going to bring Cameron a Walker in now. Cameron, uh, what were the standout moments for you yesterday? 
Cameron, are you there? It was just exquisite, oh. wasn't it, Arlene? I am here. Hello. Can you see me? I can. I can. Good to see you. Hello. Perfect. Um, the whole thing, Arlene, was just exquisite. I think the biggest standout moment for me was the moment of anointing, the most mm. holy part of the ceremony, listening to Zadok the priest echo through Westminster Abbey. It sent shivers down my spine. And it was a moment between the king and God. He wore just a simple white shirt, so none of the crowns, none of the regalia, none of the robes. Uh, and I just thought it was a beautiful moment. Uh, I also loved, of course, looking at cheeky Prince Louis as well in the crowds, watching his grandfather uh, for, it, for his coronation. And actually, the moments that Prince William paid homage mm. to his father, the kiss on the cheek, I think it showed the relationship between the two of them, the heir and the sovereign. And I think that's a relationship which clearly has been rocky over the years, but one that's certainly strong today. Yeah, and we have, the UK was on display to the rest of the world yesterday, weren't we? Um, the, the military parade, I thought, was outstanding. Yeah, I mean, the coronation, I think, was Britain at its best. Yeah. Uh, showing the world our great buildings, the Abbey and uh, Buckingham Palace. Also, today, we'll, we'll be seeing Windsor Castle. But you're quite right, the things that we do best, the pageantry, but also, if I should say, the music, you know. Oh, the, the, king, music the, the king is the greatest lover of classical music since Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. He commissioned 12 new pieces of music, and some of them were absolutely beautiful. I mean, instant classics. Um, Sarah Klaas did a spectacular piece. And then suddenly, when you're sitting there listening to the coronation, pieces from Handel, Zadok the Priest mm. to, to other pieces that were performed, you realise how many pieces of world music came out of our own coronations. Oh, That's been another great British contribution to Western civilization. was the, the variety of music, Elgar as well, that was played, mm. and uh, William Walton's Crown Imperial, I think. And also, you just look at the Bible was a freshly, mm. wonderfully bound book, British craftsmanship you can see from the investments and so forth, a real celebration of all that's best about Britain. And, of course, the celebrations continue today and Will Hollis is in Lutterworth in, uh, near Leicestershire uh, or in Leicestershire I should say uh, just uh, south of Leicester. Uh, Will tell us what's going on there. Well, this is where the party is. You can hear some music in the background, but you can see as far as your eye can see, Arlene, uh, a massive long row of the table all the way down the high street here in Lutterworth. Lots of people join in. Uh, still a few seats empty, but lots of people who have arrived nice and early are the Weirson family and the Branch family. Um, can I just ask you, what is it that you've brought today in your uh, packed lunch? What's the coronation uh, food? Uh, we've got coronation chicken. Um... Uh, sausage rolls, all things like that, and lots of Prosecco. <laughs> there was talk about a coronation quiche. Is that something you've bothered about? No, we're not bothered with that. No, not enough time with a little one. So. Quiche is more of a, a, a coronation for the Queen type of thing. I think the King is probably happy with a pork pie. Um, what are you going to be doing today, apart from eating a few pork pies? I see you've got some bubbly as well. I shall be drinking the rest of this uh, and probably drinking some more of it. And then once you've had a few drinks, do you think you'll be singing a uh, God Save the Queen, uh, God Save the King, sorry, God's later I, on? I'll do my best, yes. I think we'll be saying God Save the Queen accidentally for quite a, a few years to come. We're so used to it. But God Save the King on this occasion here in Lutterworth. Um, you can just see all over this high street, Arlene, Arlene, hundreds of people, lots of dogs, lots of food, and lots of people enjoying this street party in Lutterworth. Uh, for bringing us the celebrations from uh, Lutterworth. And back to you, Cameron. I mean, Cameron, we've had three huge royal events uh, over this past year. We've had the Platinum Jubilee, then followed, sadly, by the funeral of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, and now we've had the coronation. So we're really showing how we can uh, show to the world how to put on these big events. Absolutely. And millions of people around the world would have tuned in yesterday to watch the King's coronation. And I think some people would see us as a real asset having the British monarchy because it shows that power of soft diplomacy and how the British monarchy can really bring countries together. Even the day before the coronation, the King hosted a big diplomatic reception inside the building behind me, Buckingham Palace, hosting those 100 or so heads of state and the other 203 countries represented at a diplomatic level uh, inside the palace before the coronation. And then, of course, they were all in, inside Westminster Abbey yesterday. Uh, and also the show that we put on, the 
uh, both the King's procession to Westminster Abbey and the coronation procession coming back towards uh, Buckingham Palace following the service. The largest military procession we had seen since Winston Churchill's funeral. 7,000 troops uh, took part. 4,000 were marching. The other three were lining the route. So it truly was uh, Britain at its best, I think, the pomp, the pageantry. And you just had to see it being in this uh, media village, which we are outside Canada Gate at Buckingham Palace. There was reporters from all over the world. So clearly it's of interest across the entire globe rather than just here in Great Britain. Cameron uh, is still at Buckingham Palace. Thank you so much for joining us. And just finally, Rafe, I mean, the point is a lot of detractors will say that the monarchy is an outdated uh, mode of, uh, of governing a country and to have a head of a state who is a monarch. I think yesterday showed us that the people still love their monarchy. Absolutely. I mean, the, the naysayers said nobody would come out for the Golden mm. Jubilee or the Diamond Jubilee, and the public came out in their droves. Then they, then they said, oh, that's because it was the Queen. No one's going to come out for the coronation. Right. Mm. And the great British public swamped London yesterday, despite the horrific we weather, proving once again that the Twitterati don't represent the great British public. And, you know, the idea that the monarchy is antiquated, as I've said many times, the world's most socially progressive, egalitarian, democratic countries are monarchies. Sweden, Norway. Norway, Netherlands, Canada, Australia, Japan. In what way are those countries old-fashioned? And every year the UN lists its countries of the best nations in which to live by human development, and the majority of those countries are, are monarchies. So the idea that it isn't actually uh, a, a suitable for the times, I think, is just a non-starter. Yeah. And it was a wonderful day. Rafe, thank you so much for joining us for now. And thanks also to Cameron Walker and Will Hollis. We'll talk more later, uh, but now you're watching Sunday with Arlene Foster and GB News, Britain's news channel. Coming up, much of England went to the polls on Thursday for the local elections. Northern Ireland does the same in a few weeks. We know the winners and losers, but what happens next? That's all after the break. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the show. Well, much of England went to the polls this week to vote in local elections. Anticipated to be an indication of what might happen in the next general election, it was a night to forget for the Tories, who lost control of 48 councils and more than 1,000 councillors. The losses exceeded the very worst predictions. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says his party is on track to win the next general election. Although there are no local elections in Scotland or Wales, voters in Northern Ireland will go to the polls in two weeks later on the 18th of May. Well, Nigel Nelson is senior GB News political commentator and he joins me now to go through all of this. <laughs> um, Nigel, a bad night at the office for the Conservative Party, which they predicted, but I don't think they thought it would be as bad as it was. No, I think the prediction was, was, was meant to be expectation management. And what yeah. they were really hoping for was, say, losses of about 700, um, on a good night, 500. So, um, in fact, that their expectations turned out to be to be correct. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was a disastrous night for the Tory party. I mean, now you've got more Labour councillors for the first time in years. Yes. And we always talk in political programmes about red walls and blue walls. Sometimes I think people understand what those are about. But the red wall, when we talk about it, is the north of the country, which would have been traditionally Labour. And Midlands. And the Midlands as mm. well. Um, and that went uh, to to the Tory party under Boris Johnson in 2019. So those seats are always very closely looked at. What happened there? Uh, what I think happened there is that people have, uh, people don't think there's been the Brexit dividend that Boris Johnson promised them. So um, an awful lot of these seats were leave seats. Mm. And I just, I just think that they feel it hasn't happened, that the great things that were promised for Brexit haven't happened. And they only lent Boris Johnson their vote. So they're drifting back now to the Labour Party, which was their natural home. Yeah, and I I read somewhere, uh, I think it was yesterday, that uh, one of the Labour MPs was saying that uh, pro-Brexit voters are now coming back to the Labour Party. Do you think they've forgiven the Labour Party for what they tried to do during Yeah, Brexit? I also think that the Labour Party has changed hugely since mm. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, the most important thing for a, a Brexit voter is there's no chance that Keir Starmer will try and do a second referendum or try and take Britain back into Europe. Um, I mean, th that has now been settled. Uh, I know Brexit hasn't been settled, but at least the, the fact that we are out and will stay out certainly has. And then we had the surge in the south, if you like, the blue wall seats, uh, where the Liberal Democrats had a very strong showing. Yeah, and the, the, the Libs have done really well, mm. um, which obviously brings on to the question of uh, if there might be a coalition, whether yeah. or not the Libs yes, would actually be would be a possibility. But certainly, yeah, I mean, there were seats that um, Labour were target seats for Labour, but weren't quite sure they'd capture Medway and Kent being, I think, an, a, a unitary authority, uh, absolute key seat for Labour. All these things point to a general election victory, although we shouldn't really take local elections as being, <laughs> being a kind of precursor of, an, of a general election result. But still Labour in the situation, we're not quite there for an overall majority. The, the, depending on which calculation you use, they're between seven and nine points ahead of the Tories based on this vote. Not quite enough. Yeah. Um, do you think they'll be disappointed about that? Obviously, they're putting a very brief face on it and saying what a wonderful election uh, it was. Uh, West Street Eam was on the Camilla show earlier on saying that, you know, if this election happened, Sir Keir would be on his way to number 10. However, he would need the votes of another party, wouldn't he? It would be a hung parliament. That's what it looks like. I mean, the only thing they can, they can hope for, there were no elections in Scotland, so we don't quite know what the voters think there. Mm. What Labour hoped to do is get across the line by getting 15 to 20 MPs in Scotland on the basis that the SNP seems to be in meltdown. Uh, so the SNP have got a lot of work to do to get their act together by general election time. Mm. But yes, I mean, so, uh, suddenly coalition is back on the table. And what I think the Tories will now use as a tactic 
Sunak is to say if you vote Keir Starmer, you'll get the SNP. Mm. What Keir Starmer says is there's no way at all he would do a coalition with the, with the Scots Nats. But will the Lib Liberal Democrats go into a coalition again, given their experience in 2010? Well, yeah, they're interesting about that. Mm. Um, I think they'd be forgiven for that. Mm. Um, and that these results showed that. When Nick Clegg went into coalition in 2010, I remember him telling me that he expected this, there would be a price to pay. Mm. Um, I don't think he thought the price was going to be quite as high as it turned out to be. Mm. So I think that, that, that now 2010 is a long time away and Ed Davey now has a chance to build on these results. Got 14 MPs at the moment. He'd look to get 20, 25, something like that when the election comes around. And the SNP, you're convinced that Keir won't do a deal with the SNP? <sighs> I'm convinced he's, he's absolutely he determined <laughs> at the moment not to do a deal. Uh, in politics, I'm never convinced about anything until the time comes. But certainly, he has said absolutely no question of a deal with SNP. Uh, and what about if the Tories were in a hung parliament situation, do you think they'll go back to the DUP again, she said? <laughs> <laughs> Inevitably, I would have thought, yes. I mean, obviously, it depends on, on where we are with a hung parliament. Um, I mean, the Tories going back with the Lib Dems, I think, is much less, uh, less likely. Mm. But certainly DUP, yeah, there's a good chance of that happening. <laughs> well, my goodness, uh, there you are. I didn't think I'd be talking about another hung parliament, uh, Nigel, so soon. But anyway, thank you so much uh, for joining me to discuss the local election uh, results. Well, the pomp and ceremony of yesterday has given way to street party celebrations today with thousands gathering as planned. There's the Big Lunch initiative that aims to bring neighbours and communities together to share friendship, food and fun, as well as hundreds of more informal parties and get together. Well, GB News Yorkshire and Humber reporter Anna Riley is in Market Waiting, and GB News North West reporter Sophie Reaper is at Lee at a party picnic. Let's start with Anna Riley in Market Whiten. <laughs> Morning, Arlene. Yes, you can probably hear the party atmosphere going on here. We've got music, we've got plenty of bunting, we've got picnic benches set up for people coming here to have some food and drink. And over here is fantastic. At the town hall, we've got people taking pictures with King Charles and Queen Camilla cut out so people can come along and pose next to them. And in the town hall later on, there's going to be a competition because people have been making cakes fit for the monarchy. So they've been making them in the shape of the king and the council are going to be judging who they think the best cake is. So plenty of fun here. It's just getting started at around 12 o'clock but people are already getting in that party atmosphere for the big lunch here in Market Wheaton, small village in East Yorkshire and a little fact for you, Giant Bradley was born here, he's the tallest man in Britain. Anna, and we're going to move on now to Sophie Reaper and she's over in Lee. Well, we are about to start spinning into a day that's surely to be very fun here in Lee. Like many places all over the UK, friends, family, communities will all be coming together to enjoy the big lunch. Of course, yesterday it was all about the pomp and the pageantry taking place in London. But today is the day that we can now all start really getting involved. A little bit earlier on, I spoke to some of the people setting up stalls here to ask why they're excited to be part of such a historic event. People will be out today looking for something to do with their families and having a bit, bit of fun and um, helping to celebrate the coronation, yeah. Also, we love to support local business. Uh, we love to um, do things for different events. So we've got the, the King Charles's and it's a historical event, so we're happy to be a part of it. We're going to be making crowns today with young people, families here today. So uh, using it, a mix of natural materials and recycled materials. The parade yesterday was absolutely fantastic. I've never seen anything like it. And I've, been, I've seen a few, I must admit. I've, I've, I was in the army for, 20, uh, for nine years and was in prison service for 26 years and it was I've served my con country, I've served my queen, and I love it, I really do. Fantastic. 
Well, the fun is now well and truly underway here on this ride. Well, that's not all that's taking place here in Lee today. People are being encouraged to bring their own picnics down to enjoy on the table set out. But there's also there's stalls, uh, there's food vans just over there. You can see an ice cream van. There's other rides, a bouncy castle and a hooker duck. Truly a really fun day for members of the community, friends and family to come down and celebrate the coronation of King Charles the third. Uh, Sophie, you're making me quite sick <laughs> going round and round and round. I hope you're OK. Um, but tell me, uh, what is the weather going to be good for today? It looks fine at the moment. I hope it's going to stay that way. It's a, well, I've got a very strong stomach, so don't you worry about me. The weather is it's looking good. There's a few clouds, but we have got sun. So I don't know that we were expecting sun, but we have got some right now. So I think we're going to make the most of it. And once, once I get off this ride, I'm going to be making sure to spend some time enjoying the atmosphere here in Lee. Well, huge thanks to you, uh, Sophie, up there in Lee. I feel quite dizzy after all of that. But thanks to Anna Riley and Sophie Reaper. Well, spending by well-wishers and tourists during the coronation weekend is expected to bring a billion pounds boost to the economy. Shops, has, uh, shops have stocked up on coronation memorabilia, everything from biscuit tins to T-shirts. Some souvenirs, such as those from the Royal Collection, are expected to sell out quickly. And because there are limited supplies, they will increase in value over the next few years. Well, Tracy Martin is a collectibles expert, and I'm delighted to say she joins me now in the studio in a beautiful floral dress. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> and you've brought a few uh, collectibles in to show us, Tracy. Tell us about them. OK, I've bought quite a diverse range Great. of things. So it'll appeal to everybody mm. and also to every pocket yes. as well at the moment because there isn't always a lot of disposable no, absolutely. income. Um, starting with um, sweets and chocolates, actually. So... I've brought in some chocolate bars. You could have a oh, packet excellent. of these, Arlene. <laughs> I'm always keen on that. Yeah. Oh, aren't they beautiful, yes. Um, so packaging is a massive area of collecting mm. and also you can eat the chocolate as well and just keep the packaging. So mm. they cost a pound a packet um, and then obviously they're not going to have the King's Quest and everything on there any longer. In fact, I struggled to get another packet yesterday mm. where they're all sold out. So um, this is more about the packaging collectible of the future. Probably not worth a great deal of money, but a few pounds possibly, mm. and you've got to eat the chocolate as sure, well, didn't you? Absolutely. So uh, that's a must. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the key thing about all collectibles, and I'll show you some more in a minute, especially with royal memorabilia, it doesn't always increase in value. Yes. So, for example, we've got all the souvenir newspapers today. Um, I went and bought some, and there were so many people buying them this yes. morning with me. They're mass produced. Everybody now knows to keep them pristine and pop them away. So they don't massively increase in value. But with all raw memorabilia, it's about buying something that invokes that memory of that historic event. Mm -hmm. And I think buy something because you gain enjoyment from it. And also it just reminds you of where you were that day. Yes. I do love a handbag, though. Oh, excellent. Do you like a handbag? Yes, I love a handbag, as you know. And I love Radley handbags, too. Oh, so great. Do you want to <laughs> look at that one? That's... So this is great. Because this has got obviously everything you need from a handbag on it, um, and also if I can don't mind just turning it around, it's oh, got yes. Coronation 2023 20, on the back. Now this comes in at 29 pounds mm. from Radley. They've got a whole range of bags mm. um, right at Radley. But the thing is, with collectibles, if they've got a, already have a collectible following, mm. which Radley do, people love their handbags, they love their signature bags, that has more potential mm -hmm. to increase in value than something that not necessarily has that collectible base. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your container then, or is that a container or what is that? Oh, that is uh, something other than a container. Vodka. Oh my uh, goodness, that's <laughs> very grand. This is a great, this is a company that actually um, started up during the pandemic. Mm. Um, they got together, they started to produce this vodka and it's gone crazy. Everybody loves the bottle is beautiful. You would keep that bottle after you had drank the contents. That, that's the whole point. And yeah. at the moment, they've obviously got this um, King Giles coronation crest on it. You could probably only have that if you're licensed. So, again, yes. that adds to the value. Normally, they're just plain gold bottles. 
And the vodka tastes amazing. Mm -hmm. So again, you can drink <laughs> the vodka and keep the bottle. People will be surprised, but it's a little early to try and drink vodka sure? in the studio. <laughs> um, but uh, what else have you got there then, Tracy? Um, biscuit tins, oh, we yes. can see. Um, we've got, well, this one's a tea bag tin, and then we've got a couple of biscuit tins. When it comes to buying tins, there again is a, a huge following for mm -hmm. collecting mm -hmm. tins. Again, a lot of this stuff is mass produced. Yes. Um, don't expect to make any money out of it, but if you do, it's it's a bonus in years to come. They're just lovely things, um, pieces of memorabilia, just reminding us of the event. And um, there's various tins out there. We've obviously got Marks and Spencers and all sorts of yep. things there. Um, the real collecting, though, is in the official merchandise. And this little box oh, here, I you think. you got it there. Box. Yeah, that's it. So that's from the... It's a little um, trinket box. It's a little trinket box. It's from the Royal Trust Collection. They produce all their official mm -hmm. memorabilia, a lot of the limited... And how do you know it's official? Is there a mark on it? Yeah, you also, it's, it's marked, but also you, you buy it on their website, okay. basically, or their shops, mm -hmm. you know. They're, they're and you pay shops. for that... And pleasure. you pay for that pleasure. Yeah, yeah. That little trinket box was about £45. Pounds. My goodness. There was a limited edition one that was a lot more money, and that mm -hmm. sold out instantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I mean, just finally then, um, when you think of memorabilia, and when I think back to uh, Charles and Diana's wedding, and everybody had memorabilia, the tea towels, yeah. the, the cups and saucers, the mugs, do you think it's such a big thing now, Tracy? There are a lot of people out there that collect it, mm. and not just in, in the UK, but obviously abroad, Americans, Australians, they all love the Royal Memorabilia. Yeah. The key thing is really the money is the things that are touched, owned, signed by members of the Royal Family. Oh, okay. um, you know, pieces of the wedding cake, things that are really rare. That's where the money is. Mm -hmm. But if you just want a nice memory, perhaps get a few pennies, just buy a few bits. <laughs> Tracy, thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us the memorabilia that's out there. I'm sure that many of our viewers and listeners will have been purchasing some of that uh, during this past week. Uh, thanks to Tracy for all of that and to Anna and Sophie. Uh, you're watching Sunday with Arlene Foster and GB News, Britain's news channel. Coming up, a concert fit for a king. We're live in Windsor where the stage is being set for tonight's star-studded concert. That's all after the break. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate okay, Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years, I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. Benjamin, yeah. That is that is the Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to the show. Now, Lionel Richie, Katy Perry, Take That and Ollie Murs will be among the artists taking part in a special concert to mark the King's coronation at Windsor tonight. Those in the audience won the right to be there after taking part in a ballot. GB News reporter Lisa Hartle is at Windsor for us. Lisa. Hello, yes, well, um, it's certainly got a lot busier as the morning's been going on. So many people walking around with crowns on, flags, the atmosphere is so lovely. And in the street, I met two couple, two, not two couples, two people that were lucky enough to uh, be, win some of the tickets, the 20,000 tickets that were out there available. And you guys, Gary and Shelley, you got, you got two of them. Yep, um, we entered a ballot back in January and couldn't believe it when we got the email free it, we got tickets. Just so lucky, so excited now. And how, how are you feeling about tonight? So excited. Just the buzz is brilliant. So, so happy to be here. Exa just cannot wait for it. What's the part that, because we've got Lionel Richie, Katy Perry, who else is performing now? Take that. Who are you most looking forward to seeing? Definitely take that. <laughs> Definitely one of our old favourites from years ago. And um, why, why did you, because I love your crowns as well, by the way. You told me that they were given out on the train, so I'm guessing there's a lot of people walking around Windsor with these on. Yep, anybody that came on the train at all, you can see about the streets that it's just full of crowns. Um, I think it's brilliant that the railways were doing that. No, it's, it's just brilliant. I'm just so excited to be here. The atmosphere is brilliant and the streets are just buzzing. Have you ever experienced anything like this before? Never. Never and probably never will again in our lifetime. It's just to be here, to be part of the whole history and just the tradition of it all and watching the um, on TV yesterday the whole service and everything was just amazing just to be just to be seen, to be part of it here tonight as well is, is just amazing. Brilliant, fantastic. <laughs> and uh, do you think you'll be able to spot the king in the crowd tonight? Well, I'm hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. I'd seen on earlier that the uh, king and queen are coming, so just getting, getting so close to them too, it'll be brilliant to they see them. After everything yesterday, like we were on that occasion, like it was great to see. I was so emotional, like watching and getting crowned, like and it was brilliant to see. I spoke to a lot of people yesterday, especially in the crowds around um, like the Mall, and there's quite a few people describing the day as emotional. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, it's just after the Queen passing too, you know, because I went over and done the seen the Lion Estate. I was emotional back in, and seeing him getting crowned yesterday, like I was just it was sad too, you know, because there's more to be proud of, like no getting crowned, like. And it's so. following on as well that we're keeping the tradition here and for, for our children and for their children as well in years to come as well that the monarch is still here and still and you can see yourself the crowds. Mm -hmm. You know, the people still do love the, the, the royal family and we are one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so proud. Proud to be British. And is there any a lot else to look forward to tonight? There's um a landmarks across the UK being illuminated. Yeah. Lighting up a nation it's called uh, yeah, but it'll be brilliant to see like fireworks. I think drones and stuff are gonna be so be. Ah. No. And, and an appearance from Winnie the Pooh, I hear. Yep. <laughs> Definitely one of the stars. Uh, yeah. yep. <laughs> She'll be looking for honey. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Well, have an amazing time and thank you so much for chatting to us. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. So the concert starts tonight at half past eight. Like we said, 20,000 people were lucky enough to get tickets. And um, so... There's going to be a lot, lot to look forward to, but of course it's not just tonight, because it's today where there's lots of street parties going on, not just here in Windsor, but across the UK. And also some um, people I've been speaking to have said they're also doing that tomorrow. So three days of celebrations for the coronation. 
Lisa, well done in getting two people from Northern Ireland uh, to come on my show today. I was really impressed by that. <laughs> I have to say, it was lovely to hear their accents uh, in Windsor. <laughs> and uh, I'm very much looking forward, like that lady, to take that. Uh, tells you more about my age probably than anything. But uh, I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, we'll be back to you later on, I'm sure, uh, in the programming. Well, Royal Broadcaster and historian Rafe Hayal Manku is back with me again. Yes, I think it does say a little bit about my age. Uh, take that I'm looking out for, but there's quite a, an array of talent coming on today, isn't there? Yes, I, I'd be hoping for a Rat Pack. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking for Frank Sinatra. Cover bands <laughs> to come out there. But yeah. um, yes, I mean, um, you'll remember, of course, famously at the Golden Jubilee and Diamond Jubilee, Prince Charles, as he then was, came on stage and said, oh, yes. Mummy. Yeah. Uh, it was so now lovely. it's his turn, yeah. turn to, as sovereign to have his own concert, the first one he'll be having, the first concert ever to, be t to take place at Windsor Castle. Normally they take place obviously uh, at Buckingham Palace in the gardens there or in front. Um, the King, as I've mentioned before, is the most passionate member of the royal family when it comes to classical music since the time of Queen Victoria. Mm. And we always used to wonder when the Queen attended those concerts how much she really enjoyed the music because we know her favourite singer was George Formby. <laughs> there were <laughs> been a long time since she had uh, turned out nice to get heard on that, that stage. The King actually has not just the, the pop stars, Katy mm -hmm. Perry, mm -hmm. uh, Ollie Moores, as you said, take that, Lionel Richie, uh, but also we're going to have uh, Sir Bern Turf the Turfle, the great Welsh oh, baritone. Yes. Yes. Uh, Andrea Bocelli will be performing. Oh, lovely. And we're going to have the Royal Ballet Company, the Royal Opera House, the Royal Shakespeare Company even. Um, so you're going to have quite a quite variety an of performances, mixer, I think. It? So there'll be something for yeah. everyone yeah. to enjoy. 10,000 tickets allocated geographically across the country so that wherever you are, you had an equal chance of actually getting admission to that. Yeah. And I think it's great. And actually, I was, I was just thinking, you know, with the coronation and this sort of thing, there are very few times in our nation now where we have common shared moments of culture. Mm, mm. You know, we don't all watch the same four TV channels, so yeah. we don't watch the Morecambe and Wise Christmas show, mm -hmm. and we don't have those bonding moments, like Americans call it, water cooler moments, to gather and just yeah. talk about things. So for us, it's actually sporting events mm. and these great royal set pieces that provide the only times when we actually watch the same thing and can actually bond as a nation and create moments of national identity. Everybody will remember where they were for these sorts of things. And then again, also now, we have the, the street parties. Mm -hmm. People these days don't really know who their neighbours are, That's especially true. in big cities. And through street parties, you get social cohesion. People will be meeting and chatting for the first time to their neighbours, hopefully having a little WhatsApp group, maybe. Mm. And so, you know, that's how the monarchy helps the nation come together. You're so right about that. I think that's really, really important. And I think during the whole COVID interregnum, um, people started to find out more about their neighbours out of necessity and wanting to help them. And I think that continues with the events like this and street parties and that unifying part of the monarchy, which is so very important. So yesterday, London was the place to be uh, and it was the focus of the nation's uh, attention. We're now moving to Windsor. And of course, Windsor was, if we're told, and I'm sure you will comment on it, the favourite place of Her Late Majesty the Queen. That's right. Windsor Castle and Balmoral, both yes. the Queen's favourite seats. Um, it became her primary residence towards towards the end of her life. Windsor Castle now is, is largely unused. Uh, mm. the, the King, of course, is primarily at uh, Clarence House now, but he also likes to go to Highgrove. Mm. Um, oh, does he still go the, to Highgrove? Yeah, the, the, king, right. ha the yeah. king has a few more properties because yes. the Queen was occupying the main residences. Yes. And so in Scotland, he's also got the Queen Mother's former residence, which he may Glams, prefer to Balmoral, yes. Yes. Uh, Bur Burkhall as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a question as to whether, because part, as part of this desire to slip down the monarchy, he may decide to um, open up more of the residences to the public. Uh, as before, I mean, like Hampton Court is, for example, mm. or the Tower of London, these places were or, once... Or Royal Hillsborough, uh, which that, is the or, seat yes, in Northern indeed. Ireland, and, exactly. And Hillsborough, Hillsborough also very yeah. much so. And so that's going to be interesting to see what happens. At the moment, the King doesn't live at Buckingham Palace. Some people may be confused because the Royal Standard has been flying above the, the palace. Normally, that's only when the King is in residence. But actually, when, he, when he's in Clarence House, they also fly the flag above Buckingham Buckingham Palace in a break with tradition because his office is still there, all his staff are there, there are mm. too many of them for Clarence House. Whether the King will move into Buckingham Palace once this major re renovation and refurbishment takes place remains to be seen. We know in the past he said that he's very keen to see Buckingham Palace opened to the public 
ideally year-round even. Currently, it's only open to the public in the summer months, when mm. traditionally the Queen would be elsewhere. Um, so there could be some exciting and interesting shake-ups to mm. the tradition. Because uh, the Queen had obviously had her set routine, Sandringham and uh, Balmoral and, uh, and, 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 and Windsor, but we may see a very different type of monarchy emerging. Yeah, because he loves Clarence House, doesn't he? And he, he, that was his late grandmother's home, and he then became resident when she passed away. Uh, and it's such a short distance from Clarence House to Buckingham Palace. He may see Buckingham Palace as his base, as it were, but that Clarence House is more homely for him. Do you think yes. that's a possibility? Well I, I, well, I think with, for most of the royal family, having grown up in these grand palaces, they do prefer the intimate side of things. Yes. And they do like, actually, and, and their, their actual suite of rooms is actually far less grand than you would think, mm. but, because people see the state rooms. But, sure. yes, it's a very... It's walking distance between the palace sure. and Clarence House. Not that the king would be walking to <laughs> no. work, but it's very... You could just say, yes, this is my home, and that's the office. It's just not a short commute. Yeah. Very briefly, and we're coming to the top of the hour... What about the royal children yesterday? Weren't they amazing? They were glorious. I mean, that, that it was so beautiful to see them all engaged. I kept having memories of King Charles watching his yes. mother yes. being crowned in 1953. And, you know, this isn't, the coronation isn't just about the stability of the monarchy over a 1,000 years. It's also about continuity. And there's wonderful visuals of the king in the coronation chair, but then off to the side, Prince William, all on his own, and then the rest of the royal family, including Prince George, to the side. And they were showing us that this is the continuity. There yeah. are two more generations to come. So all is well in the world. We're stable and secure, and we have a great future the ahead. The future is bright. The future <laughs> is bright. Well, thanks so much for Rafe for the moment. He'll be back with me in the next hour. But at the moment, you're watching Sunday with Arlene Foster on GB News, Britain's news channel. And coming up, we'll have more street party fun with GB News reporters right around the UK. That's all after the weather. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst and welcome to your latest GB News weather by the Met Office. Well, wetter weather is on the way, but plenty of sunshine today. It's been rather warm. It stays muggy over the next few days too. Today's ridge of high pressure starts to move out the way, opens the doors for the Atlantic weather systems moving in, bringing some wetter and breezier conditions for many of us, some heavy showers in there too, staying unsettled for the working week. Fine evening to come for much of the UK. We will see some low cloud across some eastern coast still, but it is ice to the west as cloud and rain pushes in from the Atlantic as we move into the early hours, affecting western areas by the end of the night. Some of the rain could be heavier at times, clearest, driest conditions holding on in the east. A mild start to Monday morning, temperatures in double figures for many, but a wet and windy start across western areas. This outbreaks of rain pushes its way eastwards through the day, perhaps some sunshine just about holding on for East Anglia for the longest, turning brighter behind across Scotland, Northern Ireland. Some sunny spells here, but some really heavy showers developing for Northern Ireland in particular, some rumbles of thunder, local flooding is possible. Where we get the sunshine, temperatures reaching around 18 or 19 degrees, stuck under the cloud and the rain, it will feel quite chilly. Into the evening time, still some showers are rumbling on, but they should fade away into the early hours. Cloud and rain continuing to push slowly eastwards across England and Wales and elsewhere as we go through towards the end of the night into Tuesday morning we'll see drier conditions spreading in from the west and temperatures generally with cloud around holding up in double figures for many of us. So a bit of a grey mixed start on Tuesday morning, some sunny spells, the risk of some rain across eastern areas perhaps heavy for a time across North East Scotland, but it should brighten up slowly through the morning, some sunny spells, but also a scattering of showers developing. It stays unsettled over the next few days, further showers and rain, temperatures a little above average. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7 p.m. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon and welcome to the second hour of Sunday with Arlene Foster. More good conversation and coronation chat. Coming up after yesterday's formality, the fun on the streets parties. And thousands of you are expected to gather at street parties, lunches and community events. We'll reflect on the fun with our GB News reporters up and down the land. Also, the big help out. King Charles wants us to get volunteering tomorrow to mark the coronation. Why is volunteering good for our health? That's all after the news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Arlene. Good afternoon. It's midday. Here are the latest stories. The Metropolitan Police is facing criticism for arresting 52 people on the day of the coronation. The force says they were taken into custody for an array of offences, including conspiracy to cause a public nuisance. Graham Smith, the chief executive of anti-monarchy group Republic, was held for nearly 16 hours. He says there's no longer a right to peaceful protest in the UK. However, Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser told Camilla Tomini new police powers are there to be used. We brought in some legislation. The police said they needed more powers. So we've given them uh, them. And I think then the police have to uh, use their operational powers, their intelligence to make the right decisions and the right calls on the day. Well, the Met Police say the arrests were made in a proportionate manner, in line with relevant legislation. However, Oliver Feely Sprague is Amnesty International's policing expert. He told us the laws may have been misused. We are being told that, 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 that we were being told that we were preventing serious disruption. 
the laws and the powers that, that, that they've been using are defining that serious disruption as people in yellow T-shirts holding placards? Is that is that really the kind of country you want to live in, where where people who have had a long tradition since the suffragettes onwards of, of standing for what they believe in, do we really want to see people being protest, being arrested for holding placards? I think no. Well, coronation celebrations are continuing today as thousands of people across the country hold a coronation big lunch. The Prime Minister and his wife are hosting one in Downing Street with volunteers, Ukrainian refugees and the First Lady of the United States expected to attend. The Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh are joining a big lunch in Cranley in Surrey and Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie are taking part of, in one in Windsor. Buckingham Palace is calling the lunches a nationwide act of celebration and friendship. Then later on this evening, 20,000 people will join the newly crowned King and Queen at Windsor Castle for the coronation concert. We should be seeing some live images now of the castle where preparations are underway. Later on, take that, Katy Perry and Lionel Richie will all be performing with special appearances from Tom Cruise, Dame Joan Collins and Sir Tom Jones. And as part of the concert, light displays will also be lit over historic landmarks in Blackpool, Gateshead and Cornwall. These people in Windsor told us they're looking forward to it. It's been very special. Um, it's not normally quite as jolly and full of bunting as this, but um, it's been great to see people from across the globe come to our town. Uh, we're from Thailand, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very nice uh, to be part of this <laughs> and uh, we uh, like to see everyone celebrating, of course, for the king and uh, that he has been waiting for so long. <laughs> That's expected, I think, 20,000 or 40,000. I have no idea, but it's going to be really busy. <laughs> Prince Harry has arrived back in California less than 24 hours after his father's coronation. The Duke of Sussex caught a British Airways flight just hours after the service to return home to celebrate his son's fourth birthday. Yesterday marked his first public appearance alongside his family since the release of his controversial memoir, Spare. Ailsa Anderson is the former communications secretary to Queen Elizabeth II. She told Camilla Tomini Harry did well to juggle his responsibilities didn't have a, a, a part to play because he's not the heir apparent. And, of course, it was Prince Archie's birthday yesterday, yes. his fourth birthday. Having to, to combine his official duty as the king's youngest son with his duty as a father. And we know, as working women, you know, it's a balancing act, isn't it? Yes. So he managed to, you know, well done him for doing both yesterday. Thousands of Liverpool fans booed the national anthem before kick-off against Brentford yesterday. God Save the King was played at all Premier League grounds to celebrate the coronation, but some people in the stands at Anfield chanted and jeered during it. The club's manager, Jurgen Klopp, has defended the fans. But we have, thank God, since a while, and not everything is better nowadays than it was in the past, but we have the freedom of free speech, and that means of free opinion as well. And I thought how the people did it. It was clear that something like this will happen. I think everybody knew it. Um, and that's allowed, meanwhile. And it's allowed, and that's fine. At least eight people have been killed and seven wounded in the United States after a man opened fire at a mall near Dallas, Texas. The gunman, who authorities think acted alone, was killed by a police officer. The injured includes a five-year-old child and three people are said to be in a critical condition. There's been nearly 200 mass shootings with at least four victims in the US this year. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Sunday with Arlene Foster. Huge thanks to Ray there for bringing us the news. Well, King Charles has spent a lifetime waiting to start his job. At 74 years old, he was the longest serving Prince of Wales. There's no doubt his late mother, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, was held in huge regard, not only in this country, but in the nations of the Commonwealth and around the globe. 
But what of King Charles III? Already Belize and Jamaica say that they may become republics in the next few years, although remaining in the Commonwealth. What will be the themes of the reign of King Charles III? In a moment, we'll speak about all of that with royal broadcaster and historian Rafe Heilmanku and to former Australian MP Tim Smith. But first, let's go to GB News royal correspondent Cameron Walker at Buckingham Palace. Cameron. Good afternoon, Arlene. Well, it was just an incredible atmosphere down here at Buckingham Palace and indeed in central London yesterday. First, we had that magnificent King's uh, procession carrying the King and Queen from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. And then that service encompassing tradition dating back to 1066 with the first coronation held in there um, uh, by William the Conqueror. Uh, and having a bit of a modern twist on things, we had 12 new, new compositions of music. We also had uh, different faith leaders uh, greet His Majesty the King following the coronation and the most sacred part of the service of all, that anointing with holy oil. Zadok the priest, Handel Zadok the priest, that famous bit of music uh, really did send shivers down my spine and I'm sure uh, many people watching us on GB News here felt the same way. And then we had the huge coronation procession with the Golden State coach, the King and Queen newly crowned inside, traveling through the streets of central London. Crowds were cheering, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in central London. And then, of course, that famous balcony appearance with members uh, of the royal family. And the fly past scaled back, yes, because of the uh, poor weather conditions, but nonetheless, a pretty spectacular sight for those who are actually here in central London and those watching on television as well. And thank you so much for bringing us that overview of yesterday. And we're going to touch on uh, the service now because one of the issues facing King Charles will be countries in the Commonwealth rejecting the monarchy. The Prime Minister of Australia, Anthony Albanese, when he won the election in 2022, created the Office of Assistant Minister for the Republic, showing his party's commitment for Australia to become a republic. Now, Royal Broadcaster and Historian Rafe Hayalmanku and former Australian MP Tim Smith are with me in the studio and we're going to have a discussion about all of this because, Tim, you felt yesterday that there wasn't enough emphasis, perhaps, on the other realms of His Majesty the King. Tell us about that. Yeah, Arlene, I thought it was disappointing. D don't get me wrong, yesterday was magnificent. Yes. It was absolutely magnificent. Except there was one aspect of the service that I thought was... It didn't quite pay due deference to the realms of His Majesty outside of the United Kingdom. And that was when he took his oath of office and yeah. swore to upheld, uphold the law of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, there was then no mention of his other 14 realms, unlike in 1953, where Her Majesty specifically swore to uphold the laws of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, Ceylon, and Pakistan, the, well realm, the realms that. as they were at the time. Yes. Now, it wouldn't have been too hard for the Archbishop of Canterbury to mention the 14 other realms of His Majesty the King, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica, Belize, St Kitts, um, etc. Tuvalu. Et Tuvalu, <laughs> Papua New Guinea, yeah. the Solomon Islands. Um, it wouldn't have been too hard. Mm -hmm. And I just think it kind of paid a little bit of lip service to what is a very important part of the monarchy and what is a very important pa part of Britain's soft power around the world. I mean, we know why Barbados became a republic. It wasn't via referendum. It was, the monarchy wasn't rejected by the people of Barba yes. Barbados. It was rejected by the politicians of Barbados yes. because of Chinese influence in Barbados. Yeah, and you've raised a very interesting point, Rafe. Did you notice that yesterday as well, that the other realms weren't mentioned in the oath, as they had been in 1953? That's right. Well, we, we knew some days in advance that they that they wouldn't be mentioned in, in the oath. And, and like yourself, I thought that was a huge mistake. And I know very much from my contacts around the Commonwealth realms, particularly Canada, Australia and New Zealand, that many monarchists were actually annoyed by that. Because yeah. if you don't actually visibly mention the Commonwealth realms, then, of course, the argument goes that this is just a British coronation. Uh, for example, even the beautiful um, invitation that was sent out to everybody, which my friend designed, beautiful, 
I was amazed that this thing had just British meadow flowers on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, gosh, why wouldn't the palace actually think to put the fern of New Zealand in, to put some maple leaves in there to signify that? Mm. Now, on the, on the positive side, down the Mall, we had the Union flag yes. as normal, but then we had all the Commonwealth realms in order of seniority from, from Canada down. Uh, also, during the actual coronation, we had the procession of the Commonwealth realm prime ministers there. Um, but, of course, there we also had the Governors-General, who shouldn't have been there, because the Governors-General represent the King in the King's absence. They should have done what they did in 93. They should have been back in their countries, mm. hosting their own coronation events on yeah. behalf of the King and the Sovereign. So, they, the, so there's a two-faced problem here. One, I think, the reason that the oath wasn't included in the, the realms is because perhaps the palace thought, we don't want to inflame Republican sentiment in those, in those countries. But I think that's a very curious type of logic that was, that was I think, used. Yeah, it's, no, I, I think it's curious as well, because uh, by not including them in the oath, surely it sends a message to him. Well, I agree, Arlene, and, and Rafe, you're, you're spot on. I, I think the monarchy uh, and the king, uh, you know, it underestimates the popularity of the monarchy in places like the South West Pacific. Uh, the monarchy is incredibly popular in the Solomon Islands. Yeah. in Papua New Guinea. In fact, it was reaffirmed by a vote of the people of Tuvalu within the last 15 years. Yes. So don't underestimate your popularity and the good that you can do. I say this to the palace. Mm -hmm. um, equally, one I think one of the most poignant moments of yesterday's proceedings, which was largely ignored by mainstream media, was when the flag bearer of Grenada, mm -hmm. Johnston Bahari VC, was saluted by a lieutenant colonel in the guards as he entered Westminster Abbey. There, we can see it on the uh, the screen there. So we all know that figure very well. He's carrying the flag of Grenada. But why is it important for the lieutenant colonel to salute him? Because he is a Victoria Cross holder yeah, yeah. and um, everyone suits, salutes a Victoria Cross holder. And um, I thought that was a wonderful moment. And the, what if I'm slightly critical of... Um, the national broadcaster in this country. Yes. When they simply and I was watching their coverage in, in I was flicking obviously How between G dare I was you? flicking between How dare between G V News and, and the BBC obviously but, but when they sort of just say oh, oh the Commonwealth. Well as Rafe as you said, the flags on the Mall aren't well they are obviously Commonwealth countries, but they are realms. And there are fifty six Commonwealth nations, but there are only fifteen realms and they ought to be treated slightly differently. And I don't think yes. I mean for example the Wales has returned to Buckingham Palace in the Australian state coach. Yes. And these little things are important, particularly for those of us who are ardent constitutional monarchists from Australia or Canada and the like. And um, it shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, but we do want to... I mean, the, the monarchy is always needed to be seen to be believed. Yes. And we need to see our king in his other realms. And do you think there's a risk that by trying to go softly, softly, as Rafe was saying there, um, and not including them in the oath, do you think that gives succour to Republicans in places like Australia and Canada and other realms? Um, it does show a lack of confidence in, yeah. in the Crown in those... And I, look, in 1999, um, the Republicans were... Uh, well, they were sorely defeated. Yes. Um, because changing the Australian Constitution is very difficult mm -hmm. and the Republicans can never, ever agree on the model. Do they want a directly elected president? Um, do they want an Irish model? I Irish Republic model, I might add. Um, <laughs> yes, not Northern <laughs> Irish. <laughs> um, but uh, they can never agree on a directly elected president or a president chosen by Parliament. Yeah. So uh, I think the monarchy is actually quite safe in Australia for that very reason. Yeah. The monarchy is safe in Canada because I don't think there are any major... Republican movements in Canada. Well, mm. And you need to have all ten provinces in the country have to agree on, the, on that and trying to get Quebec and British Columbia to agree on the same thing on anything. It's just... Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, I, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it, that, that we're having this discussion because I don't think I've heard it anywhere else talking about the other realms of His Majesty the King and that's why it's important that we do discuss this issue because the monarchy is a global phenomenon uh, in the UK. And when you talk about Republicans can't uh, decide on which model of president they want, it's still going to be a politician that's elected exactly, as the head exactly of state. Exactly right. I mean, the great thing about our constitution is we don't have a politician as our head of state, and it's a unifying uh, member of the royal family. Uh, the heir to the throne has now come forward. He's taken his rightful place, and that's what unifies us here. And, Arlene, to use him shocking Australian phrase, 
if it ain't broke, yeah. don't fix it. Yeah, yeah. And that's the case in Australia. Um, obviously, it's the case here. Um, I mean, this is the mother of all parliaments. This mm. is the, um, the, the, the mother of the Westminster system. Yes. It works very well as it is. Don't change it. And I think Embrace Prince Charles it. is very aware of all of that. And, but he's also very thoughtful, isn't he, of his new role, Rafe? I mean, he's very much aware of oh, the, some of the movements of Republicans across... We have to remember, of course, he's, he's had decades as Prince yeah, of Wales absolutely. to represent the Crown mm. around, around, the, around the Commonwealth. And also it's important to remember the monarchy isn't just the, the sovereign. It's mm. also, of course, the fact that you have governors-general, mm. you have a lieutenant governors in, in Canada, you've got the governors in, in, in Australia as well. So the Crown is served by a vast number of individuals representing the monarchy along with the, the King himself. But the problem is that the monarchy is being undermined in Australia and in Canada and New Zealand by the governments who are trying to visibly erase the ties that link the people to the Crown. And so I think it behooves the Crown to actually assert its connection with its Commonwealth realms yes. because it can't rely any longer on the countries to do that. So, for example, it's up to the governments of Australia and New Zealand to invite the monarch over. The monarchs can't come uninvited, but the number of invitations get very low. We just had for the Platinum Jubilee, uh, the King and, and, and the Queen, as, as Prince and Princess of Wales, went over, over there for a, for a two-day visit. Mm. Normally that would be a ten-day visit, and that was all that they were given for an allocation. Canada, for the first time, didn't issue a Platinum Jubilee medal last year. Mm. It always issues, issues medals. So if, 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 if no one is seeing the monarchy or the value that the monarchy is doing to a country, it's no surprise that you're seeing a rise of sure. Republicanism. But, but, sure. but, Rafe, unlike the Liberal, Liberal Party in Canada, led by Trudeau, who have no fixed position on um, Canada becoming a republic, the Australian Labor Party have been oh, yeah, absolutely. overtly Republican now for 35 and, years. And New Zealand as well now, of course. We have overtly Republican Prime Minister. Um, so, but, you know, the political cycle will move and the, the Conservatives will be elected in Canada again sure, but the, and, and the Conservatives will be elected in Australia again and that will again... Protect the crown. But it's, fa it's trying to get that continuity piece, which we value so much here in the UK, I think, uh, I'm going to be so bold as to say, that when governments come and go, the monarch is still here. And, and, I mean, that is the continuity, I think, that should, should hopefully be seen in Australia, New Zealand and all of the other realms as well. It, sh it should be. But what we've seen, for example, yeah. with Lord Ashcroft's poll is that, and this affects England too, but in Canada and, and uh, in Australia, mass migrations also had an effect. Because sure. Because those countries were populated yeah. by people from the British Isles traditionally. But when you have vast numbers coming in who don't have any connection to Britain or to the monarchy, and then, of course, you're going to understandably see a, a rise in republicanism. We've seen it in this country where mm. uh, the traditional Britain or traditional white Britain still supports the monarchy to the same degree it did for the last 30 years. But by a two-point margin, Asians favour a republic. Yeah. By a 14-point margin, those who are African or of Caribbean yeah. descent favour a republic. So you've got that... F but then you also have the most disturbing element, which is the fact that the youth of today are more republican than any generation in history. And they're not becoming more conservative as they grow older, in part because, in this country at least, fewer than 10% of teachers vote for conservative parties. So the... Yeah. Yes. It's, the, it's the youth and demographics well, that need to be tackled. Uh, can, I, can I just wind this up and finish off this segment by asking, by the end of King Charles's reign, and we've just begun the reign, do you think he will still have 14 realms, apart from the UK? Um, he has eight realms in the Caribbean. Yes. I, I think that inevitably... I think inevitably um, th that there will be fewer realms yeah. in the Caribbean. Mm. As for... The old Commonwealth, yes. Australia, New Zealand and Canada, I still believe um, very passionately that he will be the king of all three realms mm. when his reign ceases. Really? I agree entirely with Tim. Oh, good. Agreement. Agre agreement has broken out in this studio. Well, listen, I really enjoyed uh, that discussion uh, and it's one that we haven't heard anywhere else. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. And thanks uh, again to Cameron as well down at Buckingham Palace. Well, you're watching Sunday with Arlene Foster on GB News, Britain's news channel. Coming up, volunteering for the community while helping yourself. Why giving up your time to help others is a winning idea. That's all after the break. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to. 
by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to the show. Well, it's said the Coronation Weekend is a great opportunity to raise awareness of volunteering throughout the UK. The big help out is also providing opportunities uh, for everybody to experience volunteering and to see how they can make a difference in their communities, as well as shaping the future with volunteering group of the UK's leading volunteers involving in the charities. The big help out is open to all and any organisation or individual can join in with or register an event via the app. The objective of the Big Help Out is to raise awareness of volunteering throughout the UK and to provide opportunities for people to experience volunteering and to make a difference in their community. It's not a profit-making or indeed a fundraising initiative. Away from the controversy as well as helping the community, volunteering has proven benefits for individuals, including improving mental health and combating loneliness. And Professor Sir Carrie Cooper, Professor of Organisational Psychology and Health at the University of Manchester, is going to join me now to discuss all of that. Thank you so much for joining me. Why is it a good thing for not just the community, but for yourself to be involved in volunteering? Oh, Arlene, there's lots of research in the in the well-being field, mental health and well-being field, that shows the more you give to other people, the more you uh, give of yourself and help other people, the better psychologically you feel. There's a lot of indirect benefits as well. Now, how does that happen? Why does that improve your mental health? Well, number one, you can contextualize your own problems vis-a-vis. -vis. So if you work in a hospice, for example, or you work at a food bank and you volunteer in, the, in these kind of contexts, uh, you know, you see people who have real problems and it makes you feel a lot better about your own small problems that you have. So it, from a, a coping point of view, 
it helps you cope better because you say, you know what, I've been worried about that thing and I have to do my income tax and I'm kind of worried about my my finances a bit. But look at what they're suffering, what that person's suffering in 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 the in the context of of a cancer hospital or a hospice or whatever. So from that point of view, it's good. And the other reason it's good and this is about the loneliness bit that you mentioned, is you socially connect when you volunteer. You have a whole community that you go into when you're working in a food bank or somewhere and volunteer in the community. And so that helps you because if you're older and you have less friends as people get older and your friends die off, this gives you an opportunity of meeting your social needs as well. So psychologically, socially, and from a mental health point of view, um, volunteering is very good. And there is a lot of research to show that. And of course, uh, we're celebrating volunteering because the King has uh, himself volunteered as uh, in, in the public sphere for so many years. So it's really an honour of that that we're doing this. But I have felt for a while now, Carrie, that volunteering isn't as easy as you may think because there are so many regulations now um, uh, put in place for understandable reasons that you have to go through a lot of uh, monitoring and form filling to become a volunteer now. How can we deal with all of that? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, like if you're working with children, I think that's inevitable. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm sure we wouldn't want to take away the, the constraints there. Um, I think it, it's not it's not that complicated. In the end, it's not. If you're working with children or people who are vulnerable, yes, there will be a lot of constraints on your behavior, a lot of form filling in and, and doing that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, if you go to the Prince's Trust, I guess it's now called the King's Trust, is it? I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> um, I think really, um, you know, that, that's not that shouldn't uh, put you off. I mean, there's local politics, there's a local community, there's a whole load of uh, uh, volunteering that we all need to do, by the way, in our communities now. We're going through rough times. You know, we have a cost of living crisis. We have a whole load of things hitting us at the same time. and giving uh, giving to other people giving to the community being engaged with that it's good for you and your family that you're doing that as well you feel a part of something when we have felt from the pandemic very disconnected socially disconnected this is bringing us all together again and i'm just hoping that people do volunteer and if there are obstacles in the way they're minor paperwork obstacles accept that as a part of, of the process and just help out because we, we need people involved in our communities now and it'll be really good for you psychologically yeah. socially uh will help you and and remember mental health is the big real big issue for us now 57 percent of all long-term sickness absence in the uk economy is for stress anxiety and depression it is yeah. the largest single cost of of ill health and it's meant it's not just in the uk incidentally mental health is a big issue across the globe and we have to we have to attack that and yes we do it by having you know counseling and psychotherapy and the rest but we have to help ourselves helping ourselves means how do you get your mental health engaged how do you uh, enhance your own mental well-being and the way you do that is doing things for other people makes us all feel great uh, yeah, I mean, I've often felt that even though we live in a very connected world now, digitally connected, that actually there are a lot of very lonely people out there. And if they just came forward and joined in and become a volunteer in whatever they wanted to do, that it would really help their mental health, carry. Uh, do you volunteer at all yourself? Yeah, I do. I, 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 I volunteer and do things, a whole variety of different things. But I've, I've, at one point in time, I worked with the Samaritans. That's how I met, uh, I was going to say Prince Charles. That's how I met him, actually, because he's yeah. the patron of the Samaritans. And to be honest with you, organizations like that need people. We need at Christmas time for the lonely. We need to get out there for the the people who don't have, you know, the indigents and, and, and the homeless. We need yeah. to help them. Yeah. And and uh, my daughter and I have been thinking of next year that we were going to do that at Christmas and, and spend Christmas actually at helping with, you know, provide food for a lot of the homeless. Uh, we should all do this in yeah. one form or another.
Yeah, I, I'm a yeah. great supporter of it as well because I used to be a girl guide leader and uh, it's something that I hope we've inspired some people this morning, uh, Carrie, to, uh, to become involved in volunteering. So thank you so much for joining me uh, this afternoon. You're watching Sunday with Arlene Foster and GB News, Britain's news channel coming up. Taking to the streets, the nation celebrates the coronation with thousands of street parties. That's all after the news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Arlene. It's 12.30. Here's the latest and our top story. Coronation celebrations are continuing today as thousands of people across the country hold a coronation big lunch. The Prime Minister and his wife are hosting one in Downing Street with volunteers, Ukrainian refugees and the First Lady of the United States all in attendance. The Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh are joining a big lunch in Cranley in Surrey and Buckingham Palace is calling the events a nationwide act of celebration and friendship. Well, later on this evening, 20,000 people will join the newly crowned King and Queen at Windsor Castle for the Coronation Concert. And those watching on TV can see live images of the castle where those preparations are underway. Later on, take that. Katy Perry and Lionel Richie will all be performing with special appearances from Tom Cruise, Dame Joan Collins and Sir Tom Jones as well. Well, the Metropolitan Police is facing criticism for arresting 52 people on the day of the coronation. The force says they were taken into custody for an array of offences, including conspiracy to cause a public nuisance. Graham Smith, the chief executive of anti-monarchy group Republic, was held for nearly 16 hours. He says there's no longer a right to peaceful protest in the UK. However, Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser told Camilla Tomini new police powers are there to be used. We brought in some legislation and the police said they needed more powers, so we've given them uh, them. And I think then the police have to uh, use their operational powers, their intelligence to make the right decisions and the right calls on the day. Well, at least eight people have been killed and seven wounded in the United States after a man opened fire at a mall near Dallas, Texas. The gunman, who authorities think acted alone, was killed by a police officer. The injured includes a five-year-old child and three people are said to be in a critical condition. We're on TV, online, on DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn 2. This is GB News. Back now to Dame Marlene. Thanks to Sir Ray. Street parties first began just after First World War in 1919 as a way of giving children a special treat after the hardships of the conflict. In just over 100 years, coronations, royal jubilees and weddings have all been marked with street parties. Some are formally organised with a packed programme of activities. Others are simply neighbours getting together over a cupcake. There were street parties to mark the coronation of King George VI in uh, 1937 and for Her Late Majesty's coronation in 1953. And to mark the coronation of King Charles III, thousands of street parties are being held today and tomorrow. GB News Southwest of England reporter Jeff Moody is at a coronation lunch in Bood in Cornwall. GB News reporter Jack Carson is at the Right Royal Picnic in Cardiff. And GB News reporter uh, in Northern Ireland, of course, where else? Dougie Beatty is just outside Belfast. Well, let's go to GB News Northern Ireland reporter, first of all, Dougie Beatty, who's in Drumbo. Dougie, tell us what's going on there. Well, well hello, Arlene. I got uh, an invite here to do something I've always wanted to do, and that was ring church bells. And they have been ringing for the king all morning here, uh, just about a few miles outside Belfast and about seven miles outside Lisburn. There's now a big lunch here, uh, quite a lot going on there. Uh, there's a barbecue, brass bands and flute bands are, are coming within the next few moments. But uh, And uh, of course there's, there's games for the children and so forth here. But earlier on it was a real, real treat to actually ring the bells in the church itself. And uh, it's something that I personally will remember. And I must say that every single member of that congregation took a chance to do exactly the same thing. So Northern Ireland still very much celebrating His Majesty's coronation and it's due to go on for the next couple of days.
And Dougie, we do things a little differently in Northern Ireland. There's been lots of parades, of course, uh, you would expect that, but there's a new mural as well on the Shankill Road, isn't there? There is indeed. Uh, two, two murals there. Of course, one was, was um, last year for the, the Queen's Jubilee. And right across the road on the other side, this massive, massive mural, the whole side of the wall uh, with King Charles. Of course, the Shankill Road is always very much known as being one of the most loyalist areas inside the United Kingdom. And the people there are extremely pleased with that mural. And, and it, was quite, it was quite humbling, actually, to watch uh, when it was unveiled of how many was there and, and just what they do think of the monarch. Thank you, Dodi. Too many cupcakes there in Drumbo. Um, and there are, of course, thousands of street parties and gatherings planned, and Jeff Mudie's imbued in Cornwall. Jeff, what's the atmosphere like there? It's a great atmosphere so far, Eileen. I'm not here at a street party. I'm here at a pool party because we're down here by the water in Bood where the weather is absolutely glorious. Suddenly the sun is shining. Everybody's out in shorts. They're all heading down to the uh, pool party, which is kicking off uh, fairly shortly. We'll have live reports from the pool party all afternoon. There's going to be all sorts of typically British competitions going on. There's going to be a fancy dress competition with a, a right royal feel to it, so expect lots of outfits in uh, red, white and blue. There's also cake competitions, cake baking competitions, and something that I want to do, you can have a cream tea on board a paddler paddling across the pool. So that's what I'm going to be doing this afternoon. It's a good gig if you can get it, Arlene. Yeah, it is, and it sounds all very regal. I hope you have a wonderful time uh, there, and no doubt we'll be coming back to you throughout the afternoon. Jack Carson, meanwhile, he's at Cardiff Castle, where there is a right royal picnic taking place. Tell us what's happening, Jack. <laughs> Well, good uh, good morning. Well, good afternoon, Ali. Welcome to Cardiff Castle. Here we're here yesterday where they showed the coronation. We're here again today for this right royal picnic. We've got people on stilts that I think are dressed as Georgians, um, and we've got, of course, loads of people having picnics. Let's come round and meet one of the families that are having a picnic here today and have a bit of a, a bit of a chat if we can with them. Um, Hello, what's your name? Oh, oh hi, I'm Gabby. <laughs> Hello. Um, what have we got in the picnic today? Oh, we've got a variety of things. We've got some coronation quiche. You've made a coronation oh, quiche? I've made it. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear, no. <laughs> OK, have we tried it yet? No, not yet. <laughs> okay. OK, and what is the kind of plan today? Why did you want to come out and all have a picnic today? Oh, just um, sharing it together, really. Sharing a nice weekend together. Yeah. Did you all watch the coronation yesterday? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we'll come over to you. What, what, was, the, what was the coronation like yesterday? for you what was it like watching watching print the king charles of course has been prince of wales for so long become king oh it's absolutely wonderful a really historic day just to be part of for myself we've never been through it before and, and for my children as well to experience it so it was great hey fantastic well thank you all for speaking to us the celebrations and the picnics and the parties are going to go on all afternoon we've got music we've got some roll doll theater groups here it's all kicking off in cardiff i'm having a great time jack i i thought there that you were going to get a piece there of the coronation quiche. Have you had any coronation quiche thus far? Well, Joe Ali, I made my own coronation quiche uh, a couple of weeks ago. I had a bit of an attempt with it. I struggled a little bit with the broad beans. I've now got a freezer full of them, so I'm going to have to work out a way to, what, what to do with those. But I did try it, and do you know what? I'm a big fan. I gave it, I gave it a 10 out of 10. So you disagree with Jacob Rees-Mogg then and his assessment of the quiche, because he wasn't a fan, Jack, but you clearly are. Oh, yeah, unfor yeah, unfortunately, me and Jake will have to disagree on, uh, on that point. But I, I love the quiche. I did cheat on the pastry. I didn't make the pastry. I have, to, I have to be honest there. But I made the filling. And for a first attempt, I think it went pretty well. I'm very impressed, I have to say, Jack. And tell us, what is the weather like down there at Cardiff? And uh, uh, is this continuing all afternoon? Yeah, this is going to go on all afternoon because, of course, they've also got um, the big concert later on as well. We've got some music here. We've got some um, different activity groups that are going on. Let's say we've got we've got people dressed as rabbits walking around. We had some bees going around buzzing. This is going to go on all afternoon. And the weather so far, the rain is holding out. Yesterday, when we were here for the coronation screening, there was a few downpours. That certainly didn't stop people coming out, though, to watch the coronation on the big screen. Umbrellas, of course, will never stop um, the British public from a bit of rain. 
rain, but the rain so far is holding off and it's nice and actually, it's lovely, just nice and warm with a jacket on. So fingers crossed, it'll stay that way all afternoon. OK, Jack. Well, thank you so much for joining us from Cardiff Castle. Thanks also to Jeff Moody down in Cornwall and, of course, Dougie Beatty over in Northern Ireland. Coming up, as we're celebrating all things British, what could be more British than a nice cup of tea? But do you put the milk in first or after? We find out how to make the perfect cuppa after the break. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 That that is, is... The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. Well, the coronation has been showcasing all things British and what could be more British than a nice cup of tea? Whether it's with milk or with lemon, the British apparently drink 100 million cups of tea a day, which works out to be 36 billion cups a year. So a great deal of tea will be drunk today at street parties and get-togethers. But how do you make the perfect cup of tea? Diaz Arab is a tea expert and he joins me now. Huge thanks for coming in, Hello, Diaz. Hello, Aline. Thank you for having me. You're going to tell us about the perfect cup of tea, are you? I am indeed. <laughs> okay. uh, firstly, uh, we actually consume about 165 million cups oh, of tea goodness. a day. It's so it's that actually much. went up. Exactly. And actually, we predict that over this magnificent weekend that we must have consumed north of a billion cups of tea. My goodness. Collectively. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about how to make the perfect cup of tea. Tea. Brilliant. So, firstly, I've got the tea here. So, this is our Royal Court collection tea, mm. which is a collection of black teas mm. favoured by royal families from around the world. Oh. Of course, because we're celebrating the coronation, we're going to start with the British mm -hmm. uh, royal favourite, which is our exclusive British breakfast. Now, 
Tea must always be brewed in a fine bone china teapot if you want the ceremony and the experience. So what we're so going no to do... So no putting a tea bag in a cup, is that what you're saying, Diaz? I am, Arnie, <laughs> yes. Sorry to the nation, because I know that is the preferred yes, cup exactly. that we all turn to. Maybe, maybe we'll see more lovely pots like this before. Yes, bought, exactly. Right? Well, actually, there's a lot more appreciation now, Arlene, for speciality loose-leaf tea. Mm. Uh, we actually did a report, and it's uh, demonstrating that... 55% of us are leaning more towards herbal green mm. speciality teas. Mm. So now we're going to add the hot water. Mm -hmm. So because it's black tea, we're going to do about three grams of tea to about 200 ml of water. Mm -hmm. So that's going to go in. And the first thing we must do is put our timer on. So tea can be very scientific, Arlene. Well, I didn't yes. think it was, but clearly it, it is. Definitely, yeah. definitely is. So while this is brewing, actually, we're going to also prepare a green tea for you. Okay. Do you like green tea? I don't. I'm not as big a fan as, of green tea, but I like the herbal teas and you the like... fruit teas. I like quite like the fruit teas. Fabulous. So Ooh. green tea is an increasing trend. Mm. And we're going to show you the correct way to brew green tea in these amazing devices. So, firstly, green tea, black tea, white tea, they all come from the same plant. Mm -hmm. However, it's the process that the tea undertakes after it's been harvested mm -hmm. that decides whether it's black, green or white. Okay. Black tea is oxidised for 72 hours, then roasted and steamed, so it's very dark, very black. You need 100 degree water to make, bring out the maximum flavour. Mm -hmm. Green tea, however, has a lesser process in terms of oxi oxidization and that's why it's very light in color mm -hmm. therefore if we use 100 degree water for green tea we're going to burn it and it's going to become bitter right and almost tastes like sea maybe that's what i've been doing that's yeah. what you've probably yeah, been yeah, doing probably so we right. need to get the water to mm -hmm. 80 degrees arlene 80 degrees, so the first okay. thing i've done here is i've added some cold water here mm -hmm. to get this water down to 80 degrees so what we'll do is i'm going to add my hot water into this device so 20% room temperature mm -hmm. and 80%. It's very scientific. <laughs> very scientific. And here, what we have, you're not going to believe this, but this is tea grown in England. Oh. Yeah, so have you heard of the Jersey Royal Potato? Yes, I have, have, yes. Hopefully I can get into this. <laughs> so the same family that grow the Jersey Royal Potato actually are now growing... Oh, this thank little, you, Arlene. See this little thing here. Oh, uh, Arlene, there you uh, go. You it see? needs a lady's touch, <laughs> evidently. There you so go. this is tea grown in England. So the same family that do the Jersey uh, Royal Potatoes have now started growing tea. And it's the world's rarest tea. So what we're going to do, this is our little brewing device. We're going to take some tea yeah. and put it into here, like so, without making a mess on your lovely counter. Mm -hmm. And it's as easy as this. So this is an automatic brewing device where you put the strainer to the yes. tea. Uh -huh. You put the tea over. This is a... And then we start the magic. Oh so that's going to brew on its own now. What we're going to do here is just quite simply, we're going to brew you a tea. But instead of using 80 degree water, Mm -hmm. We're going to use 100 degree water. Ah. So just by manipulating the um, temperature of the water, you can really change the flavour and the experience. Mm -hmm. There we go. And so how do you know when the breakfast tea is ready then? Have you I've got my beautiful it? timer oh, you're, here. You're all yes. timed up and everything. And actually, if I'm very quick with this, I reckon by the time I've flipped this over, mm -hmm. our tea will be ready. OK, so now I'm going to put this timer on here. Mm -hmm. So, oh, here we have our beautiful teacup mm -hmm. and our strainer. So we always put the strainer to the cup. Now, this is actually a 22 carat embellished fine bone china teapot from William Edwards. It's beautiful. So it's affordable luxury, actually. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Arlene, what I would invite you to do is first try the tea mm -hmm. without the milk. OK. And tell me what you think. Looks wonderful. Oh, that is lovely. Oh, so a real English nice. breakfast tea, you mm. don't really need the milk, Arlene. You don't Arlene. really need, you don't need no, it. No. But for purposes of the show, let's put some milk in. And to in. show off your lovely jug as well. <laughs> yes, our lily teapot. So um, if you put the cup down. Sorry. There we are. So you just put a little splash in. 
Now, the etiquette for stirring your tea is not actually stirring. You must go from side to side okay. and not actually touch the cup itself. Okay. You don't want to make a noise or anything as such. So there you go, Ali. So let me see if I can do this. Is that the way to do it? Exactly. I can't hear anything. And that's so how the wrong it should thing be. to do is to stir. Exactly. Okay. You shouldn't stir it. Okay. Okay, Diaz. Well, I'm looking forward to having uh, the green tea uh, later on, but I don't think it's going to be ready for me when I'm time. on air. Uh, I'm definitely going to have that later on. Uh, but huge thanks to you for coming in and giving us all of the science and Absolute the etiquette. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so wonderful, much. Wonderful, wonderful to have you. Thank thanks you. to Diaz. And uh, I'm really enjoying my cup of tea and the green tea comes afterward. But Emily is with us because she's up next with her show. Emily. I am indeed. GB News Sunday. I was just wondering if I could uh, have a Get little... some green Tea. Have a little cup to uh, take me through the show. Yes, of course, we're going to be continuing our coverage of the coronation weekend, reflecting on yesterday, looking to what's happening today, all those picnics and also the concert tonight. We'll be getting the latest on that. I also want to reflect on the local elections, the big political mm. news of this week. Has Keir Starmer done enough to win a general election? I'm not so sure. There were some surprising results in there, so we'll dig deep into those as well. And what else? I do want to ask the question, what kind of king will King Charles be? What do we want him to be? And also Prince Harry. It was all a bit sad, actually. He was a, he was a bit awkward yesterday and it was very much a flyby visit. Do you think maybe he's regretting his choices? Well, when I was watching him yesterday, I have to say, I was thinking, what is going through his head sitting there in the third row? He's the son of the king. And he's sitting there in the third row. What is he thinking? It's miserable, isn't it? He well, very much did look like the spare, unneeded, but perhaps that's harsh. We'll be getting some analysis on that, of course, from our royal experts. Thank you so Should much. Should be a good show. <laughs> so, Emily's coming up uh, just after the break, but I want to say a huge thank you to all of my guests. And if you're going to a street party or helping out in your community, have a really lovely time. I'm off to have more tea. Uh, I'm going to finish my breakfast tea, and then I'm going to have my green tea. Have a lovely time this afternoon. Goodbye. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst and welcome to your latest GB News weather by the Met Office. Well, wetter weather is on the way, but plenty of sunshine today. It's been rather warm. It stays muggy over the next few days too. Today's ridge of high pressure starts to move out the way, opens the doors for the Atlantic weather systems moving in, bringing some wetter and breezier conditions for many of us, some heavy showers in there too, staying unsettled for the working week. Fine evening to come for much of the UK. We will see some low cloud across some eastern coast still, but it is ice to the west as cloud and rain pushes in from the Atlantic as we move into the early hours, affecting western areas by the end of the night. Some of the rain could be heavier at times, clearest, driest conditions holding on in the east. A mild start to Monday morning, temperatures in double figures for many, but a wet and windy start across western areas. This outbreaks of rain pushes its way eastwards through the day, perhaps some sunshine just about holding on for East Anglia for the longest, turning brighter behind across Scotland, Northern Ireland, some sunny spells here, but some really heavy showers developing for Northern Ireland in particular, some rumbles of thunder, local flooding is possible. Where we get the sunshine, temperatures reaching around 18 or 19 degrees, stuck under the cloud and the rain, it will feel quite chilly. Into the evening time, still some showers rumbling on, but they should fade away into the early hours. Cloud and rain continuing to push slowly eastwards across England and Wales and elsewhere as we go through towards the end of the night into Tuesday morning we'll see drier conditions spreading in from the west and temperatures generally with cloud around holding up in double figures for many of us. It's a bit of a grey mixed start on Tuesday morning, some sunny spells, the risk of some rain across eastern areas perhaps heavy for a time across northeast Scotland, but it should brighten up slowly through the morning, some sunny spells, but also a scattering of showers developing. It stays unsettled over the next few days, further showers and rain, temperatures a little above average. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of 
light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News.